The money printer is back and it's bigger than ever. Trillions of dollars are being pumped into the system and whether you realize it or not, your wealth is at risk. But here's the thing, for most people, this is gonna be disastrous. But if you know how to play it right, it's a once in a lifetime opportunity to build wealth. We're in the early stages of what I'm calling the money printing super cycle. And if history has taught us anything, this could be the spark that sends risk assets like Bitcoin skyrocketing higher than most could ever imagine. But what does that mean for you? And more importantly, what should you be doing right now to protect your wealth and potentially grow it faster than ever before? Well, in this video, I'm gonna break down what exactly is the money printing super cycle and why is it starting right now? How does money printing affect risk assets like Bitcoin? And most crucially, what actions you need to be taking right now today. Now, real quick, my name is Mark Moss. I've been a tech-focused VC investor for over a decade. I'm a partner at a leading tech VC hedge fund, and I just launched a new publicly traded company to invest in these assets and these markets. And this info I'm about to share is some of the exact same data we use to make long-term decisions. So let's go. All right, let's jump into it and talk about the super cycle, the global liquidity super cycle. Now, of course, I talk about global liquidity all the time, so you should be up to speed by now, but we're talking about the super cycle that's just getting started. Now, what is global liquidity? Now, a lot of times people think about the US, the Federal Reserve, M2, things like that, but we're talking about global liquidity, not just the US. We'll, we'll look at some US stuff as well. Now, there's uh, different ways to measure global liquidity, and there's really three people that I think have put together the best chart. Now, each of them done it a little bit differently, but they all sort of work about the same. So number one, Michael Howell, uh, I've had him on my show, we did an interview. I'll link to it down in the description below. And Michael Howell has built what he calls his total liquidity indicator, and I think it's probably the best, most established, most used. Uh, we also have our good friends, uh, Nick Batia over at the Bitcoin layer. They put together their own global liquidity index, and I'll, I've referenced that before. I'll link to that down below as well. And then finally, third, uh, my friend Raul Paul, we did a show recently uh, over at Real Vision. They also have a way they track it. Now, each one of these baskets is built a little bit differently, but basically it's the amount of money in the global system. But it's not just the amount of money. It's the flow of credits as well as money. So it's not just the money, it's the ability to increase money because money is increased through debt, right? So when you get a loan, house, car, boat, loan, et cetera, that money's created into existence. So it's not just the cash and savings, it's also the flow of credits, the ability to make more money, as well as financial markets. So that's sort of what we're talking about. Now, for a real rough way to look at it, you could just look at Global M2. Um, you could look at the five major central banks, balance sheets, things like that. Okay, now we wanna look at the global liquidity as measured in USD, US dollars, which of course is the reserve currency of the world. And right now, when we look at that, per Michael Howell, like I said, probably the best index, the, most, the, the oldest, most reliable, is about $175 trillion of global liquidity. Now this is a record. Uh, we're up over $10 trillion in like just the last year, so we're skyrocketing higher. But the question is, one, what does this, the liquidity do to asset prices? But more importantly, number two, what does this super cycle do when it goes up? Like how high can it go? Now to give you sort of a visual representation of this so you can understand as we dive in deeper, you can see right now we're about 175 trillion. So it's this private sector liquidity right? It's collateral because the collateral is what we can issue more debt off of. Then we have central banking money. So you understand if you're only looking at central bank balance sheets, you're only seeing a small percentage of the total, total global liquidity. Um, and then we have this, what's called the shadow monetary base. And so these are other banks, shadow banks that are able to quickly uh, produce more money, sort of like the Euro dollar system and things like that. Now, the other thing that you wanna understand, I talk about this quite often, is that the liquidity, it moves in cycles. Now, overall, it goes up like this, but it moves in waves, sort of like that. And what we can see is they move on these four year cycles, four years, four years, four years, four years, I talk about this all the time. Now, four years just so happens to have been reset in 2008 during the great financial crash, and then four years, 2012, 16, 20, 24, and each one overlays with the four-year presidential cycle, the four-year Bitcoin having cycle, and you can see right here, right on time, we are turning back up. Now, a lot of times people are thinking that, hey, it's too late, asset prices are at all-time high, or why is Bitcoin still at the same price as it was, you know, whatever, a year or two ago? Well, you're comparing the bottom of a cycle with the top of a cycle. 
And so we are not at all time high prices at the top of a cycle. We're at the bottom of a cycle and we're about to go up. Okay. So now that we understand that, let's take a look at where this liquidity is going. Now, the benefit for us is that one, we have history, so we can sort of chart it off of the history. But even better than that is the governments actually tell us this they're underestimating. We'll take a look at that. Okay. So first off, we want to look at the global liquidity over time. And Michael Howell, again, back to cross-border capital, he shows this in this log chart. So here's 2013, here's 2025. And you can see the global liquidity goes up. But as I said, it sort of ebbs and flows in cycles. Nothing ever goes up or down in a straight line, which is why it's super important that you zoom out when you're looking at your investments and where things are going. If you're looking at things on like a monthly basis, you're never going to make any sense of this because they go up and down over time. However, when you look at this over time, the global liquidity is going up. Now, if we look at just the U.S., for example, I like to show this chart. This is the U.S. M2, the U.S. money supply. And the reason why I like this is look at this trend line here. And then we started going up at a faster rate here. And then we started going up at a faster rate here and a faster rate here. And we're almost going vertical. Now, the reason why this is important is we want to understand the rate of change so we can project where it's going. Now, what we know is since about 2019, the U.S. monetary base, M2, has been expanding by about 10%. So we can just use 10% moving forward. However, this shows us it'll probably go from 10% to 12% to 15%, et cetera, right? It'll be like this and eventually like that. Okay, but let's just say 10% since 2019, which basically means the monetary base is doubling about every eight years. And that means that by about 2032, we'll have about $350 trillion in global monetary supply, in global liquidity. Now, again, the U.S. government and all the other governments of the world, the IMF, the BIS, this is from the U.S. government, the CBO, Congressional Budget Office, the office that set the budget for the U.S. And they project here 2023, where we're now, and they project out where we're going to be at 2053. This is from the government's website. So they're telling us where we're going to be. So in about 10 years, we'll be about right here. It's a pretty big gain. OK, so let's just say that we go up at this same rate. We're at 350 trillion in eight years. What does that mean for different assets? OK, well, uh, assets, they love liquidity. Why? Well, because assets are denominated in a unit of account. So, for example, oil, I don't know, whatever it is, it's $80, 80 US dollars per barrel, right? A home or let's say gold is about what, I don't know, $2,600 per ounce. My point is it's 2,600 over US dollars, okay? It's a denominator. So what happens is when the denominator goes up, it pushes the top number up. That's why they love liquidity. So we can look at it like this. Here's MSCI, which basically represents the markets around the world. And that's represented by this black line. The gold line or the, the orange line here is global liquidity. And what you can see is they move almost in lockstep. Not exactly, but almost. So as this dips down, this dips down. As this comes back up, this comes back up. And you can see that this global liquidity is pushing global markets. And that's not just global markets. Here is just the Federal Reserve and the S&P 500. And again, the black line is the S&P 500. The gold line here, or the, the orange line, is the Fed balance sheet. So when the Fed balance sheet goes up, the stock market goes up, right? And so you can understand, and the reason why is because as they dilute the money base, it doesn't mean assets become more valuable. It means it takes more currency units to buy those assets. So we can see stocks go up. We can see uh, real estate. So a lot of people think that real estate in the United States is a massive bubble, but the blue line is the Fed balance sheet or the money supply, and the red line is the national uh, median real estate. Now, what we can see here is in 2008, there was a bit of a bubble. But what we can see here is that home prices are nowhere near where the money supply is right now. And so we can see that it is pushing up with that money supply. It's not always catching up in perfect time. And gold and Bitcoin is also similar. So they're very sensitive. So we can see they move almost in lockstep. But in these green areas, you can see it outperforms or overperforms from time to time. So assets love liquidity. As the denominator goes up, the dollars, more dollars, the top number goes up as well, as you can see right here. However, some assets are much more sensitive. So for example, Bitcoin. Bitcoin is the most sensitive of those assets. 
And what we can see is that Bitcoin has about an 83% correlation. So you can see right here, here's Bitcoin, about an 83% alignment or correlation with global liquidity over a 12 month period. Here's the SPX has a 81%. Uh, gold has a 68%, uh, TLT, Treasuries has a 44%, and so forth, which goes back to this chart I was just showing you, which the 80% correlation means that in certain times, about 20% of the time, 18% of the time, it's not correlated, and it's outperforming it right there. That's what we want. So it's correlated a lot of the time, but when it's not, it's outperforming, it's overperforming. I want to take a second just real quick to just give you a reminder. The reminder is take control of your Bitcoin. Look, for the first time in history, we have a way to preserve our property, take custody of our property and protect it with no cost. You can't do that with gold. You can't do it with your stocks. And so we can do it with Bitcoin and you should. Now, don't store it on an app on your phone that can get hacked. What you want to do is use a hardware device, something like this Trezor right here. So basically your private key sits here. When you want to do a transaction, you plug it into your computer, sign the transaction. When you're done, you unplug it and put it back into your safe. I've used Trezor for now, I don't know, six, seven years because I think it's the easiest one to use. I've tried, I think, pretty much all of them. Um, and it's also open source, so you can trust the code. And again, it's easy. Why easy? Because if it's too complex, it makes me think of how many potential holes and risks there could be, not just in the device itself, but even in my own ability to secure it. So I want something fast. I want something easy. And I want something safe. That's why I use Trezor. And uh, if you don't use Trezor, use something. Please get your Bitcoin off the exchange. Use a hardware device to secure your private key. And if you like Trezor, check out the link down below. So, and a fun fact here is that for every about $1 billion increase in M2 in the money supply, we see about 1.37 increase in Bitcoin based off that sensitivity. And a fun fact, here we are in the month of October, and just in the first five days of October, the U.S. has added almost $400 billion in just five days. So this is the rate that we're at. As a matter of fact, like I said, we'll be uh, increasing much more rapidly. However, we're looking at just doubling in eight years and what that means for asset prices. Now, there's a bunch of ways that we can sort of speculate or we can sort of forecast where this goes. Uh, one way is using this power law. You might have been hearing about this lately. It's been getting a lot of uh, press, a lot of talk. And you can see sort of this log chart looking at this um, power law of Bitcoin and gold. And basically how it works is we can look at the relationship of gold and Bitcoin and how those move based off liquidity. And we can also look at Bitcoin as sort of a gold substitute. So, of course, gold has been around for 5,000 years. There's a lot of history to see how it correlates with the money supply. We can also look for the power law, the relationship between gold and global liquidity. All right. So we're going to look at gold and Bitcoin and gold and global liquidity. Now we look at gold and global liquidity because we want to see how hedges, traditional monetary hedges, have worked in times of global liquidity increasing. And what we can see is that if we forecast these two ways out using this power law and this scatter chart, we can see in eight years, which would be about 2032, gold should be about $5,000 an ounce based off of the power law here. And Bitcoin would be at about 1.5 million per Bitcoin, which is pretty big. It's a big number. However, is that number accurate? Well, we don't know. We don't know the future. This is just using these types of assumptions. But I think there's a better way to look at that. And maybe that 1.5 million number might actually be small. Let me show what I'm talking about. You see, Bitcoin isn't just a monetary hedge. And as a matter of fact, gold isn't just a monetary hedge. Gold used to be money, but today most people don't use gold as a monetary hedge. Today we use stocks. We use Tesla, Apple, Google. We use uh, real estate, uh, duplexes, triplexes, multifamily properties. We use fine art. We use collectibles. We use lots of things to store our wealth not gold. Most people don't buy gold anymore. Some people do, some of the gold bugs. Most of the central banks are buying gold in, in a large mass to protect their uh, savings against this debasement, but most people aren't. And so it's not really being used the way it used to be used before. So when we look at Bitcoin, Bitcoin isn't just competing against gold. Bitcoin isn't competing as a new technology. It's not competing as a new payment network. It's not competing against any of those things. What Bitcoin is really competing against 
is value itself, store value assets. So instead of just looking at gold, we want to look at all of the assets that people use to store their value, store their wealth. And so we can look at this chart. So for example, what we can see is gold sits here about $16 trillion. So people use gold, so that's, it's worth about $16 trillion. Some people use art, art's actually $18 trillion, bigger. Uh, some people use cars and collectibles, about $6 trillion. Equities, $115 trillion. Real estate is the biggest, $330 trillion. Uh, bonds, $300 trillion. And money, some people still save money, I save money, $120 trillion. So what we do is go, Bitcoin isn't just competing against gold. Bitcoin is competing against all of these assets that people use to store their wealth. So if we go, well, 900 trillion in store of value assets, if Bitcoin could capture just 5% of that, well, that would be 45 trillion. That'd be a 45 times return from where we are today, which would pick Bitcoin out of between two to three million dollars per Bitcoin, which sounds insane. I know, I get it, right? But Let's just take a look at this. Now, what if it doesn't get that much? Here's a chart I used in another video. This is going out to 2045. But if Bitcoin could capture 2% of those assets, it puts it at a 3 million valuation. If it captures 7%, it could put up to $13 million valuation at 7%. Now, what percent is actually realistic? Could it really get to 5% of those assets? Could it get to 7%? Could it get to even more? Well, let's use history as our guide and look at other technologies to see what they've done. So if we look at historic market capture, the way that works as a venture capitalist is that in order for me to invest in a new technology like Uber or Airbnb, I'd go, well, how do I know how much Uber or Airbnb will worth in the, be worth in the future? Well, Airbnb is going to disrupt the hotel industry. Okay, well, how big is the hotel industry? What percentage do I think is realistic to capture? Or Uber's gonna disrupt taxis and limos and vans. What percentage do I think is realistic to capture? And that's how we come up with the valuation as a venture cap investor. Now, if we look at Uber and Airbnb as real examples, Uber launched in 2010. By 2019, it had captured 5% of the taxi market. Here's a chart. So you can see ride hailing apps, going up like this while taxis are going down. And you can see they crossed right here. This is 2017. So it took Uber from 2010, so it took nine years to capture only 5% of the market. It did it. Now it's obviously captured much more. What about Airbnb? Airbnb launched in 2008. By 2016, it had also captured 5% of the market. And so we can see Airbnb growing like this. Now listen, this doesn't, obviously hotels are still here. We still, st I just stayed in a hotel, right? We still stay in hotels. We still use traditional taxis as well. They're still at the airport, but it doesn't mean that these aren't gaining value. So for these to gain value, the hotels have also gained value. The markets still go up, but this starts taking another piece of that. So we can see both of these were able to capture 5% in less than 10 years. Now, we also want to know that we're also in this quantum wave cycle. I talk about this quite often. Every 50 years, we have a quantum leap forward where we have a brand new set of technologies that create a whole new quantum leap forward, a whole new way that the world works. And we're in one right now. And Bitcoin decentralization, AI, robotics is all part of that. And what we can see is that with new technology like Uber, like Airbnb, the way that we measure technologies was something called an S-curve. You might have heard of this before. And basically, the way an S-curve works is the time it takes to go from 0 to 10%, this time frame here, is equal to the time it takes to go from 10% to 90%. So let's say this is 10 years here, then it should be able to make this leap in 10 years. And then this, then it just can, kind of continues on from there. Now, if this looks familiar, you might have seen this other chart that I use quite often, which I think predicts where we are right now. So in these quantum waves that happen about every 50 years, there's four distinct phases. We're starting phase number two right now. Now you notice this is sort of like the S curve. So the time it took to go 10% here, 10 years, is the time it'll take to go here. And now this is a much bigger growth period than the first phase. 
as you can see there and as you can see here. So the second part of this S-curve growth curve is where things really start getting interesting. Now, again, just like the hotels and just like Uber, it doesn't mean those other assets, doesn't mean hotels went away, doesn't mean taxis go away. So in this example here, real estate is still gonna get bigger from 350 trillion to 1.3 trillion. Uh, but Bitcoin is going to take a percentage of these. It's gonna continue to grow alongside those. Now, how do we play this now that we know this information? Now, uh, we can look at traditional asset allocation is like a 60-40 allocation. This is, if you work with a financial advisor, they're probably telling you put 60% into equities, 40% into bonds. Now, you hear me talk a lot about how that allocation has basically been dead. It doesn't really work that well anymore. Bonds have been getting completely smashed. However, what we can look at is keeping that 60-40 bond portfolio, but now taking, say, 1% and putting that towards Bitcoin. If we were to take just 1% of the, put that towards uh, Bitcoin, that would give us a, it would have given us a 17% return over the last five years. If we would take a 5% allocation to Bitcoin, it would have given us a 30% return, and a 10% Bitcoin allocation would have given us a 47% return by just taking a small percentage of our 60-40 and putting it towards that. To show you how this looks, you can see it in a chart right here, and what we have down here, the blue line, is a 60-40 bond portfolio. You can see it peaked here. Um, it went back down and it's back up again. However, if we give it a 0.5% allocation, we end up here. If I give it a 1% allocation, I end up here. And if I give it only a 3% allocation, we end up up there. So you don't have to bet the farm. You don't have to go all in. Even a 3% allocation could have you outperforming everything else. Now, if you think Bitcoin is good, then you can say, well, what about assets like MicroStrategy and other publicly traded assets that are even doing two, 300% more than Bitcoin is doing? And then you start to understand what the whole quantum wave thesis is all about. If you want to know more about the quantum wave thesis, um, check out this other video that I'll put up right here or join me live next week as we're going to talk about it. I'll break it down. I'll show you the assets that we're buying inside the quantum wave um, cycle that's breaking out in the second phase right now. It's a free hangout. I'll show you the charts. You can ask me all the questions. It's a good time. So come hang out. We'll put the link down below if you want to check that out. Otherwise, uh, watch this other video. Let me know what you think about this. And that's what I got. All right. To your success. I'm out.